Hare Krishna, dear devotees, please accept my humble obeisances. All glories to Jagat Guru Shri Prabhupada, all glories to Guru Dev, and all glories to you all for being here. And Hare Krishna, Mother Rukmini, thank you for being here. Hare Krishna, thank you for inviting me to Africa once again, Sadev Prabhu. Hare Krishna. So, dear devotees, uh, today we are very much honored and blessed to uh, have the association of Her Grace uh, Rukmini Devi. If you are here and uh, you are not familiar with her, then maybe you just came from a different planet recently. <laughs> um, Mother, we, we, can't, we can't thank you enough for uh, giving us your association from time to time. Thank you and, so much. Thank yes. you so much. Uh, so without further ado, I'll put the verse on the screen and then you take it over from here. Okay. Thank you all for joining. Reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 1, Chapter 19, Verses 22 and 23. This chapter is called The Appearance of Sukadev Goswami. And this is the last chapter of the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Can you all hear me? Yes. Okay. I'm using my phone. Sorry, it's a little small. Okay. Verse 22. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. So this verse, number 22. Ashrityata rishi kanavacha parikshit samam madu chut guru chavyalikam abhasatainam abhinandya yuktan susu samanas charitani vishnu. I'll say it again. Ashrutyata Rishigan Havacha Parikshit Samam Madhu Chud Guru Chavyalikam Abhyasatai Nam Abhinandya Yuktam Susru Samanas Jalitani Vishnu. And here is the translation. All that was spoken by the great sages was very sweet to hear, full of meaning, and appropriately presented as perfectly true. So, after hearing them, Maharaj Parikshit, desiring to hear of the activities of Lord Sri Krishna, the personality of Godhead, congratulated the great sages. Now, text number 23. Samagata sarvata eva sarve vedayata murti daras tripriste nehata na mutra chakas chanata vite paranugraham atmashilam. Translation The king said, This is Maharaj Pariksha speaking to the sages who've gathered there. O oh, great sages, you have all very kindly assembled here, having come from all parts of the universe. You are all as good as supreme knowledge personified, who resides in the planet above the three worlds, Satyaloka. Consequently, you are naturally inclined to do good to others, but for this you have no interest in other words, with other than this, for this, you have no interest either in this life or the next, only to do good for others. Purport by his divine grace, Shiva Prabhupada. Six kinds of opulences, namely wealth, strength, fame, beauty, knowledge, and renunciation are all originally the different attributes pertaining to the absolute personality of Godhead. The living beings who are part and parcel entities of the Supreme Being have all these attributes partially up to the full strength of 78%. In the material world, these attributes up to 78% of the Lord's attributes are covered by the material energy 
as the sun is covered by a cloud. The covered strength of the sun is very dim compared to the original glare. And similarly, the original color of the living beings with such attributes becomes almost extinct. There are three planetary systems, namely the lower worlds, the intermediate worlds, and the upper worlds. The human beings on Earth are situated at the beginning of the intermediate worlds, but living beings like Brahma and his contemporaries live in the upper worlds, of which the topmost is Satyaloka. In Satyaloka, the inhabitants are fully cognizant of Vedic wisdom, and thus the mystic cloud of material energy is cleared. Therefore, they are known as the Vedas personified. The saints are the Vedas personified. Such persons being fully aware of knowledge, both mundane and transcendental, have no interest in either the mundane or transcendental worlds. They are practically desireless devotees. In the mundane world, they have nothing to achieve. And in the transcendental world, they are full in themselves. Then why do they come to the mundane world? They descend on different planets as messiahs by the order of the Lord to deliver the fallen souls. On the earth, they come down and do good to the people of the world in different circumstances under different climatic influences. They have nothing to do in this world except reclaim the fallen souls rotting in material existence diluted by material energy. So let me see if I can, I'm going to try to turn on the link from my computer and turn off the link here, but we may get some fuzzy sound for a minute. Hare Krishna, can you all hear me okay now? Yes, I think so. Can you hear me? Very yes, good. very okay. clear. Okay, very good. Yes. So I think you can take the purport off the screen. Um, thank you so much, all of you, for being here. Thank you for welcome, welcoming, me, welcoming me to Africa once again. And I wanted to start by saying that today is the holy appearance day of Sri Advaita Acharya. And it's a, if, you, if you're able to fast, you could fast till noon today. And I wanted to say that Sri Advaita Acharya is an extraordinary personality because he's, he's God, but he's also in the mood of a servant. So he's a combined form of Sada Shiva and Mahavishnu. And he prayed for the appearance of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Um, he was an exalted Brahmin, the head of the whole Brahmin community, but he was beyond all sectarian caste distinction in all his behaviors. He always would, he was much senior to Lord Chaitanya, who was so much younger than he was, but he always prayed to be chastised by Lord Chaitanya. He was begging for that opportunity to be um, chastised by Lord Chaitanya. He also embraced the so-called untouchable Haridas Thakur, and he, um, he gave him the first offerings of the Shraddha ceremony. This is a ceremony that's performed for one's parents or father after he leaves this world, and the remnants of the sacrifice are supposed to be given to the highest class of Brahmins. So he gave those remnants to Haridas Thakur, the so-called Muslim untouchable. So he was exemplary in all his behaviors. So, and he had wonderful pastimes, we all know, with the other um, Vishnu Tattva, Tattva personality, Lord Nityananda. You can read about him, them in Chaitanya Charitamrita. I just wanted to share a little verse that he spoke 
which is very insightful into his character of exemplary servant leadership. So let's see here. Okay. Chaitanya Radasa Mui Chaitanya Radas Chaitanya Radasa Mui Tara Dasa Radas. He said, I am a servant of Lord Chaitanya, a servant of Lord Chaitanya, a servant of Lord Chaitanya, and a servant of his servants. So this beautiful verse is from Chaitanya Charitamrita Adi Lila, sixth chapter. It's the 86th verse. So yes, so now to continue on to speak a bit about the, the uh the verse and the purport, these two verses. In the beginning of the purport, Srila Prabhupada mentions that we individual jiva souls are now covered by clouds of forgetfulness. But if we begin, if we can begin to allow the Krishna sun to shine in our hearts, then we can develop up to 78% of the qualities of Krishna, but in tiny minute quantity. That's so amazing, right? So what is Srila Prabhupada talking about here? He's referring to his um, Nectar of Devotion summary study of Rupa Goswami's Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu that describes how Lord Sri Krishna has 64 transcendental qualities and 50 of them are possible for individual living beings like us to develop in tiny quantity. And then there are five more that are sometimes partially manifested in Lord Brahma or Lord Shiva. And then another five that are manifested only in Krishna and Lord Narayan. I'm going to read these. And then there are four more that are only manifested in Krishna himself. So I'm going to read, I'm not going to read all 64, but I want to read the, uh, the ones that are above the initial 50. If you want to read about these qualities, you can um, you can look in Nectar of Devotion, Chapter 21, which is called the Qualities of Sri Krishna. So, first of all, um, let's see, here we go. My book flipped. Okay, so the special uh, above the 50 qualities that are av that are available for us if we choose to develop up to 78%. There are um, five special qualities that are only there in Lord Brahma, Krishna, of course, and Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva. These are changeless. They are changeless, all-knowing, ever-fresh, Satchitananda, possessing an eternal blissful body, and then possessing all mystic perfections, okay? So then there are five more that are only there in Krishna and Lord Narayan, and those are inconceivable potency, uncountable universes generating from their bodies, the, the source of all incarnations, he is the giver of salvation to the enemies he kills, and he is the attractor of liberated souls, right? So these are the extra five that are only there in Lord Narayan and Krishna. But there are four special qualities that are only there in Krishna. So no one else has these qualities. Lord Narayan doesn't have them. And these are, it's good to learn these four, to remember, something good to remember. So first of all, there are four more. He is the performer of wonderful varieties of pastimes, especially his childhood pastimes, right? Then next, he's surrounded by devotees who are endowed with wonderful love of Godhead. Number three, he can attract all living entities all over the universes by playing on his flute, his flute playing. And then the last one, he has a wonderful excellence of beauty, which cannot be rivaled anywhere in the creation. So just to go over those four, his pastimes, his wonderful devotees with their special love, and then his flute playing, and then his beauty. Okay, got that, everybody? So. So yeah, so what's being talked about here in this purport is it's really about becoming transparent to reflect the qualities of Krishna in ourselves. Um, one quality of Krishna that manifests in the mode of goodness is transparency. Um, 
there's some essential qualities of goodness that are described in Bhagavad Gita. <laughs> Excuse me. Chapter 18, verse 42. I'll read it in the Sanskrit. Samo damastapaso cham shantim arjavam evacha gyanam vigyanam astikyam brahma karma svabhavajam. Peacefulness, self control, austerity, purity, tolerance, honesty, knowledge, wisdom, and religiousness. <laughs> These are the natural qualities of goodness. Okay. But then, of course, beyond the qualities of goodness, there are the qualities of pure devotion. Um, uninterrupted, loving devotional service that has no material motivation. This is described in, in Srimad Bhagavatam, first canto of the second chapter. Krishna is attracted to these qualities when he sees them in a devotee because he, these qualities come from his own, his own same blissful nature. Like attracts like, right? Um, pure devotion attracts Krishna, brings Krishna under the control of the devotee. Um, this is one of the first characteristics of pure devotional service. It's called Sri Krishna Karshani. On the path of devotion, the devotee experiences Krishna's bliss, and Krishna also experiences his own bliss through his pure devotee. So that's something very, very beautiful and wonderful about the exchange between Krishna and his loving devotees. But I also wanted to mention that it's, it's also encouraging to know that even if we're not such pure devotees, if we have no material desires, or if we have all material desires, or if we desire liberation, um, in all cases, we should try to approach Krishna, and he will always help us take the next step. Here's a verse that describes that from Srimad Bhagavatam, 2nd Canto, 3rd Chapter, 10th verse. Akama sarva kama va moksha kama udharadi. Tivrena bhakti yogena yajeta purusham param. So, yeah, the point is if we, you know, just imagine in your own experience, if you want to stick your hand in the fire or toward fire, right, your hand will become super hot. And if you put your hand all the way in the fire, your hand will become fire itself. So, if we want to approach Krishna, we have to also try to develop these qualities of Krishna through the process of um, conscious chanting, our sadhana, our practice, our service, associating with devotees, all those um, practices of bhakti. But as we all know, when we're covered by the clouds of material desire, that sun of Krishna is not able to shine through enough to help us illuminate ourselves and the world. Maybe you might have noticed on Back to Godhead magazine, there's a masthead at the top with a verse that says, Krishna Surya Sama Maya Haya Andakar, Jaha Krishna Taha Nadi Maya Adikar. Krishna is like the sunshine, Maya is like the darkness. Wherever there is sunshine, there cannot be darkness. Right? So when we take to Krishna consciousness, that darkness. Um, starts to vanquish, right? So you might be listening to this and you might be thinking, you might not want to say it out loud to everyone, but you might be thinking, well, this hasn't happened to me yet, right? Um, but how much have I desired this? How much have I longed for it? How much have I cried for it? How much have I looked into myself and tried to see what's clouding me? my shadow self, and how much have I begged Krishna to help me see what I'm not seeing, what I'm hiding from myself, right? Maybe even other people are seeing it. Maybe the other people in the community are seeing it, but but I'm not seeing it, right? Um, am I just in, wait, I'm just going to shut off my phone here so it stops beeping. Um, 
You know, I think I forgot to chant prayers. Let me just say a few prayers here. Oma Gyan Timarandasya Gyananjana Salakaya Chaksun Militamina Tasmai Shi Gurave Namaha Namam Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prestaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swamaniti Namane Namaste Saraswate Teve Koravani Pracharine Nivishesha Sunyavadi Paschatya Deshitarine Banchaka Pataru Pyascha Kripa Shindu Bhayevacha Patitanam Pavane Bio Vaishnavi Bio Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitana Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shiva Sadi Gora Bhakta Vrindam Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare I have to apologize to all of you. I was so excited to share something about Sri Advaita Acharya that I forgot to chant the important prayers and beg for mercy, which is what I'm talking about right now, begging for mercy, right? So yeah, so I was thinking, um, how much have I really begged Krishna for his mercy? Am I just in a kind of a blame game that, um, you know, thinking inside myself, maybe I don't vocalize it to anybody else, but this process of Krishna consciousness doesn't really work. It's all a bunch of false promises. I tried. Nobody's really experiencing this. Um, yeah, but there are great spiritual scientists like Sukadev Goswami, who we're re reading about in these verses of Bhagavatam, Maharaj Parikshit. And Srila Prabhupada, great spiritual scientists who've tested the formula and found it to work. So what about you? And what about me? Right? Is this possible for us as well? Or are we just going to be stubborn thinking it's stubborn and stuck? Are we just going to be stubborn and stuck thinking this is not possible for us? Yeah, and it's said that the lotus feet of Krishna are like a boat that so many saints and sages have used to get to the other side of the ocean of material miseries. And the miracle or the mystery about that special boat, um, that's so different from every other boat you ever heard of, is that they've those saints and sages have left that boat on this side for us to use as well. Isn't that such a beautiful miracle? So Srila Prabhupada calls Krishna consciousness a science. And he also, it's also an art. So it's a science and it's an art as well. So I looked up in the dictionary. What does Webster say is the definition of science? Science is a branch of knowledge or study dealing with a body of facts or truths systematically arranged and showing the operation of general laws. So yeah, so have any of you ever done a science experiment in a chemistry class and maybe the experiment didn't work? Why didn't, why didn't it work? Well, the first question is, did you follow the instructions? Um, did you wash the test tube first before starting the experiment? And if the answer is, oh no, I forgot that part, then, uh, then what, do you, what do you expect, right? And so in the same way, by the same token, if we don't deeply engage with the authentic principles of Krishna consciousness, con Krishna consciousness, what do we expect? Isn't the science of the soul, the science of becoming free from the cycle of repeated birth and death, isn't that the greatest science of all, the highest achievement that could ever be achieved, right? So it's the greatest science. So we need to apply the science as it's prescribed by the great scientists. So then what about art? What's the definition of art? Webster says that art is the quality, production, expression, or realm of what is beautiful um, or of more than ordinary significance. So could we say then that Krishna consciousness is the science of how to meet the beautiful supreme personality of Godhead face to face by becoming transparent to his own beauty reflected in ourselves, 
right? Because by nature, we're of the same beautiful quality also. So that's the point that is made in this purport so beautifully by Srila Prabhupada. And I, I really want to highlight um, in Srimad Bhagavatam, third canto, 28th chapter, 32nd verse, in the purport, Srila Prabhupada describes something very, very beautiful. He says that the entire universe is full of miseries, and therefore the inhabitants of this material universe are always shedding tears out of intense grief. He says there's a great ocean of water made from these tears, but for one who surrenders to the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the ocean of tears is at once dried up. He says one need only see what? The charming smile of the Supreme Personality of Godhead then the bereavement of material existence immediately subsides when one sees the charming smile of the Lord. Isn't that beautiful? So that's why I'm saying it's a science, but it's also a beautiful art, right? And um, here's a bit more about his charming self to attract our hearts. I wanted to share this with you. This is from Rupa Goswami's Padyavali. He says, he's talking about his dear Krishna. He says, because he is tender with affection, because he promises to make you fearless, because he quenches the anxiety of the anguished, because he is munificent, because he withers sin, because he offers a home of infinite fortune, his mere desire turns an ocean into dry land, dry land into ocean, a speck of dust into a mountain, a mountain into a clod of clay, straw into diamond, a diamond hard bolt of thunder, a thunderbolt into simple straw. He can turn fire as cold as ice and ice into a flame. All my obeisances to Lord Sri Krishna, who loves to play in wondrous and mischievous ways. Isn't that beautiful? That's why I say it's a science, but it's also an art. So this is Padyavali, verse number six. Padyavali is Rupa Goswami's um, ver uh, verse book of his favorite verses. You can also have a verse book of your favorite verses, just like Rupa Goswami. So I wanted to say Srila Prabhupada describes faith. So we can't really approach this transcendental, beautiful realm without a speck of faith, right? So how can we get a speck of faith in this um, wonderful realm of Krishna? Srila Prabhupada describes faith as a, an unflinching trust in something sublime, an unflinching trust in something sublime. Okay, so what does sublime mean? Um, what's the definition of sublime? Sublime means elevated or lofty in thought or language, inspiring awe or veneration, supreme or outstanding, higher, noble, or pure. That's the definition of sublime. Prabhupada uses that word sublime, right? So what could be more sublime than Krishna, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Vrindavan, his own spiritual home, the devotees of Krishna, the teachings, descriptions, or pastimes of Krishna with his loving devotees, right? So how do we get this faith? Srila Prabhupada explains that faith is awakened by the agents of the spiritual world, who are the Vedas personified. We can't just think, we can't just learn a little bit of Sanskrit and then hang a shingle outside our door that, oh, I'm a great scholar of Sanskrit. And um, no, we have to take it from the great saints. We have to take the understanding of the Vedas from the great agents of the spiritual world who are emissaries of Krishna. And um, Srila Prabhupada describes those emissaries of Krishna as messiahs 
um, toward the end of this purport. This is so beautiful. I want to I want to share this again. This is from the purport we read today, talking about these agents of Vaikuntha, these emissaries, these messiahs. Prabhupada says, they are full of knowledge, both mundane and transcendental. They are practically desireless devotees. In the mundane world, they have nothing to achieve. And in the transcendental world, they are full in them themselves. Then why do they come to the mundane world? They descend on different planets as messiahs by the order of the Lord to deliver the fallen souls. On the earth, they come down to do good to the people of the world in different circumstances and different climatic influences. Like Srila Prabhupada, we heard he came to Africa five times. Why did he go to Africa five times? Because they have nothing to do in this world, save and except to reclaim the fallen souls rotting in material existence. That's us, right? Deluded by material energy. We were all rotting in this material world. And these emissaries, these messiahs come to save us, to reclaim us and bring us back to Krishna. So to me, this whole purport is about how to awaken that transparent shining that reflecting of Krishna's beautiful shining qualities in ourselves. But then we naturally have to think, what's the nature of the clouds that cover us? So after Krishna, in the 16th chapter of Bhagavad Gita, after Krishna describes the transcendental divine qualities in the 16th chapter, in the first verse, you can look it up. Then he describes the the clouded qualities of our lower nature. These are all the things we don't want in our character. Pride, arrogance, conceit, anger, harshness, and ignorance. So just as Krishna is so attractive by his beautiful qualities, when we see these qualities in ourselves or someone else, we become repelled, right? If someone's angry, we want to run away. Or if they're proud, or arrogant. We just want to run away and hide, right? So I think we have to beg Krishna to help us to see these clouds in our own character and not see those clouds in the character of others, right? And beg Krishna to shine his Krishna sun into our hearts so that we can better see ourselves, see the world as it is, and see Krishna himself in truth and to see in all humility, not finding fault with others, right? So, you know, in these verses, these the, the last few verses that you all read in this chapter, we can see the humility of the great Maharaj Pariksit. He's, look at, he's the most exalted emperor of the whole world. And the words he expresses in some of these verses of this chapter, I wanted to read a couple of them. Let's see, verses 15 and 16. Oops. Let me see. Verses 15 and 16. Oops. Here we go. Sorry for the pause here. Okay, this is... Maharaj Pariksit speaking. Now he's the emperor of the world. He's not just the president of, of Kenya or the US or Canada. No, he's the emperor of the whole world. And he's such a great personality that sages have come from all over the universe just, just to assist him at the time of his death. Here's his humility. He says, oh, Brahmanas, just accept me as a completely surrendered soul. And let Mother Ganges, the representative of the Lord, also accept me in that way. For I have already taken the lotus feet of the Lord into my heart. Let the snake bird or whatever magical thing the Brahmana created bite me at once. I only desire that you all continue singing the deeds of Lord Vishnu. And then in the next verse, again, look at his humility and his eagerness to hear, right? He says, Again, after offering obeisances unto all of you brahmanas, I pray that if I should again take my birth in the material world, I will have complete attachment to the unlimited Lord Krishna. 
association with his devotees. And here's a really important one. And friendly relations with all living beings, right? So this is the nature of the humility of such a great personality. So yeah, Srila Prabhupada came as a transparent Messiah from Krishna in all humility to deliver us from this rotting material world. And we also need to, what, he's, what did he ask of us, right? He crossed the seven oceans and seven seas and then went back around the world 13 times. So what is he asking from us? Um, we need to imbibe this mood from him if we're going to be able to touch the hearts of others and share this beautiful shining sun of Krishna consciousness. Yeah, so this is not just book knowledge that we can learn a little Sanskrit and uh, think we know everything. No, it's a mood of empowerment and humility that has to be imbibed from the great messiahs, right? So I want to close this class with just one little story of Srila Prabhupada. He was speaking at a university about the qualities of the first class person, the second class person, and so on. And one proud, arrogant student challenged him. And he said, oh, so I suppose you think you're a first class person, huh? And Srila Prabhupada responded in such a humble way, so exemplary for all of us, um, such a great Messiah, but yet he's responding so humbly. He said very quietly, he said, oh, no, I am only 10th class. I am only the servant of all the others. This was his response. So this kind of humility will open our hearts and open the hearts of those who hear us, those who come to our temples to meet us or meet us anywhere. You know, People will be so moved by those qualities of humility. They'll be attracted that what is this person tasting? I want to taste that too, right? So the essence of Krishna consciousness is to taste what? The holy name of Krishna and to share that taste with others in all humility. So I wanted to close with these, something beautiful from Bhaktivinoda Thakur from his Sharanagati. I find this also very artful, his words, very poetic. He says, he's talking about the holy name, first of all. He says, I shall buy and plunder, that means steal, the mellows of the name of Hari, and becoming thoroughly intoxicated by those liquid mellows or, or rasas of the holy name, I shall become stunned. By touching the feet of those great souls who are able to relish those mellows, I will be constantly immersed in the sweet nectar of the holy name. And then he tells us how we can share that mood. He says, when will there be an awakening of compassion for all fallen souls? And when will this Bhakti Vinod, forgetting his own happiness with a meek heart, set out to propagate by humble entreaty the sacred order of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. So this is the transparency of the Krishna sun shining in the heart of a compassionate devotee. So thank you all so much um, for being here, for listening. And what was important for you here? What's a takeaway for you? Or maybe maybe you might have some a question. Thank you all so much. Hare Krishna, thank you so much, Mother Rikmini, as always, uh, for the beautiful uh, Krishna Katha. And uh, so many things to be learned, uh, especially if one paid close attention to your sharing. And I, I believe others may have questions also. And if someone wants to share the takeaway from the Katha today, one may also do so. So, yes, we're talking about reflecting, right? Reflecting yeah. the Krishna sun. So let's reflect back. What did yeah. you hear? Yeah. So you may indicate by using the hand emoji or your physical hand and you'll be asked to unmute. What I say, I, I have learned so many things, but what I would like to share uh, particularly is when you first started speaking, you were talking about Sri Advaita Acharya's uh, appearance today. Yes. Uh, we, are, we are like 
about 90 minutes away from breaking the fast. How, even though he is the combination of Sada Shiva and uh, Mahavishnu, he felt he couldn't propagate the chanting of the holy names of the Lord. He had to invoke the Supreme Lord himself and the Lord himself came as Lord Chaitanya. So that tells me that, of course, this is how I understand it, but I'm also putting it to you for a clearer and better uh, explanation or understanding that devotional service is, is not so easy to be imparted onto another person without the mercy of the Lord. And therefore, uh, as much as we are eager to disseminate, uh, to disseminate the teachings that has been given to us, we constantly have to cry for the mercy of the Lord. Otherwise, our effort may not be very effective. What do you think about that? That's absolutely beautiful. Thank you for such a beautiful shining reflection. You know, here we are, tiny, tiny jiva souls, and we want to try to reflect back out of gratitude. We want to reflect back some, we want to do something to show Prabhupada and our own gurus our, our gratitude. And here's a, a, he's actually a Vishnu Tattva personality who was feeling so incapable, right? Isn't this amazing? So Krishna, <clears throat> excuse me, Krishna is the original. There's a verse in this first canto we were just reading today, Ete Chamsa Kalapunsam Krishnas Tu Bhagavan Swayam. So there's so many different incarnations, but Krishna is the original. But what's amazing is here's Advaita Acharya, who, like Balaram, like Lord Nityananda, they're, they are themselves the personalities of Godhead, but they're always in this serving mood, right? What to speak of us? So Advaita Acharya was so humbly offering Tulsi leaves and Ganges water, begging the Lord to appear day after day after day, feeling himself so un incapable to share the holy name and to, to save the people that he saw to be so fallen and so puffed up, so proud of their mundane learning there in Navadvi. He felt so incapable. So how should we feel? Can we become puffed up? What fools we would be if we become puffed up. So this is his example. That's why I called it servant leadership. And um, Bhakti Tirtha Swami wrote so much about servant leadership. And I think we are really fools if we think we can lead without that mood of a servant, um, praying to be a servant. You know, that, that first verse I read of Advaita, Chaitanya Radhasa Mui, Chaitanya Radhas, Chaitanya Radhasa Mui. Um, what's the last line? Tara Dasera Das. I am the servant of Lord Chaitanya, the servant of Lord Chaitanya, the servant of Lord Chaitanya, and the servant of all his servants. So that's what we should be reflecting. That's what we should learn from these great examples, these great messiahs who've come down to save us. Thank you so much. What else? Any more reflections? So Anyone yeah. else with any reflections, questions, realizations? Please. Uh, Ms. Andrea, please unmute. Hare Krishna. Thank you so much to all the devotees at Hare Krishna Africa for hosting this Sangha. And thank you so much to Rukmini Walker Prabhu for this class. Uh, before I leave, I just wanted to quickly reflect that the quote that I wrote down was uh, that Krishna consciousness is the science of becoming transparent to Krishna's own beauty in ourselves. And I added a little note for myself as an instruction and in others, just because that's my personal instruction that I'm getting from this class is to, to look for Krishna's beauty, not just in myself, which is a challenge, but also in others and to kind of take that on for the day. So thank you so much. I so appreciate it. Thank you to everyone. Thank you. thank you for that beautiful addition, looking for the beautiful qualities of Krishna in ourselves and others. Usually the materialistic mind is always looking for faults, right? But we should be like the honeybees to try to see what the, the beautiful qualities are. You know, even, 
if someone would make a mistake, like I remember once when I was serving in the temple in Boston, Srila Prabhupada, one lady had cooked and she forgot that she had salted the sabji, so she salted it again. So it was inedible, but Srila Prabhupada didn't say anything. And when the Mahaprasadam came to the devotees, everyone saw that it was no one could eat it. But Srila Prabhupada hadn't said a word. This lady was a little bit proud by nature. So the next day she cooked again and she corrected her mis mistake and she made everything in such a wonderful way, so delicious. And the next day, this is something to learn. The next day, Srila Prabhupada said, oh, the sabji is so nice. Everything is so nice. Yesterday it was a little salty, you know. So... Uh, what a lesson yeah. in how to teach in the mood of servant leadership. Thank you, Andrea Prabhu. Thank you so Hare much. Krishna. Thank you so much, Mother. Anyone else with any question? Uh, Mother, you were talking about uh, the example of Sri Prabhupada's humility when he was giving a lecture and uh, one uh, very proud student was challenging him are you so are you a first class person Shropa said he's a 10th class uh, there was a similar situation in one of Shropa's uh, public lectures in one university in Melbourne where Shropa was seriously attacked verbally and uh they were, they were Christians. They were asking Shri Prabhupada, uh, the excuse, it's very offensive. They were yelling at Shri Prabhupada. And he was sitting quietly, but the devotees, uh, Shri Prabhupada disciples, they did not sit quiet. <laughs> and so my, my understanding is that yes, the spiritual master is the spiritual master. He is the Messiah. So, he may have compassion for the fallen conditioned souls for their nonsense, but what should be the mood of the disciples? For mm -hmm. example, like I was saying, the disciples at the time, uh, they actually told the uh, upstarters, we came here in peace, but if you want to act crazy, we will meet you squarely with your craziness. So I, I, I think that is the mood I would, I would take also if, if I find somebody being a nuisance uh, to my guru day or to devotees in general. Mm -hmm. what, what, do you, what do you say about that? Well, there, there, are different, there could be different answers, but I think one important answer is to, to know the strength of, your, of yourself and to know the strength of the person who's opposing you. Um, I'm reminded of a nice quote from, we have in the US president, former president Obama, and his wife was a really brilliant, is a really brilliant lady, Michelle Obama. So they got attacked a lot, especially because he was the first black president of the US, right? So they got attacked a lot. And so she had a saying that I thought was really beautiful that I, my husband Anutama Prabhu and I always say to each other, we say, when they go low, we go, go high. high. <laughs> <laughs> You've heard it before. When they go yeah, low, yeah. we yeah. go high. When they go low, we go high. So when people are coming down to that level of, of anger, conceit, pride, arrogance, um, you know, we can go get down and dirty with them and cause a big riot and a fight. And what will be the result? A bunch of people maybe you know, get uh, harmed or killed or who knows what, right? Or we can go high. So um, I think the example, there's another story of Srila Prabhupada that's very beautiful. Someone was attacking him verbally. I believe this was at one of the Pandals in India. Someone was attacking him, just like lashing out at him, criticizing. Prabhupada was just sitting so humbly, just, you know, looking down. And afterwards, the devotees asked him, um, what, well, you know, what, what was that about? And what should we have done? And Prabhupada was saying, oh, it must have been some offense that I made to that person in a previous life. 
so humble. But your question is really about what should the disciples do? But I think it's it's very good to respond in a, in a mood of gracious humility and try to help the person, remove the person from the situation of creating offenses, right? Like, what would I do? If I were in that situation, I guess I would go up to that person and try to speak to them and say, I, I like what you said at first, we came in peace. So let's, let's also um, just di uh, discuss in peace, okay? So we could, what I would try to do is probably help that person leave the room and maybe I could talk to that person in the other room. It's really interesting, you know, you mentioned Christians, but they're just like Vaishnavas, they're Vaishnavas who are in different moods. There are Christians who are in different moods and Srila Prabhupada would always extract the mentality of the person who was speaking. He wouldn't um, meet someone at face value. He would always see in the heart. So I think, uh, I think arrogant behavior, conceited behavior can also be turned around um, by, by gracious humility. I'm reminded a, a friend of mine has an Italian grandmother who used to say that, I guess there's a saying in Italy that the grandmothers or the parents say to ch when children are misbehaving, when children are being naughty, they say, oh, you will make God cry. You will make God cry if you act like that. So I think that's a, a beautiful way to respond that, you know, um, we're, all com we're all coming from God. Let's not make God cry today by our by our behavior. Let's see how we can come together and honor the divinity within each of us. That's a good way to respond. Um, you know, it's all about Srila Prabhupada said that the devotees should come together every year to Mayapur to talk about and discuss unity and diversity. So uh you know, each one of us is individual. Each one of us is a different, diverse person, and we all think in different ways. But to have unity and diversity means to honor the other. What is community? Community means to welcome the stranger. <clears throat> Excuse me. And what's humility? Humility means to honor the other, the person who's different from me, who thinks differently and acts differently from me. So I think we can try to bring out this mood by the way we respond, even if someone is acting arrogant, you know, like you might meet an aggressive person on book distribution. If you respond by punching him or her in the nose, how's that going to help the situation, right? When they go low, we go high. I think that's what Srila Prabhupada is asking of us. Yeah. Is that good? Yeah, it, it's good, Hare Krishna. <laughs> but... I I have have uh, I've had an experience like that before, and uh, actually I I punched the guy. You know, there was there was there was this guy making fun of my seeker. And then what happened after you punched him? Well, he stayed away from me because. Uh, like you're saying, I, I assessed myself and I assessed the guy who was making fun of me. I was in a public transport. Mm. Uh, during book distribution, I was moving from one place to another. And this guy kept, he was sitting behind me and he kept pulling on my seat and, and making mockery of me. And everybody was laughing at me. So I told him, hey, buddy, what are you doing? Don't do that. Mm. And he kept doing so. And I uh, he was pulling my head so forcefully behind, you know. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the reason why he did that was because he thought I was a foreigner. I didn't understand the language, but mm -hmm. I mean, it was in my mother country. Uh, it's, my, it's my mother tongue. I understand the language. But because usually when we go out, we speak in English, he thought I was an immigrant and making more of So I gave a punch in the nose and he stayed away from me and said, ah, so this people, <laughs> so I, I'm thinking, de depending on the situation, sometimes I believe that fire has to be quenched by fire, not water. Well, sometimes, I mean, that's what Krishna yeah, told so. Arjuna in Bhagavad Gita, right? Because yeah. they tried, tried, tried. They used good, peaceful words. Krishna himself went as a messenger. They tried, tried, tried. And finally... It was unavoidable, but you have to assess the, you know, the strength of the other person. And yes. 
you know, yeah. what what is going to be the impression of the people who are witnessing that also, you know. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you another story, if I may. Please I'll do, yes. So once in Boston, I was on Harinam Sankirtan, and this guy came up and punched the, um, the, the devotee who was leading the kirtan. He just came and punched him right in the stomach. And the devotee was, you know, so shocked, he kind of fell over. And then what happened was, you know, the police came, and it, it actually went to court. And that man who had punched the devotee, he made up a story that that devotee had attacked him and that he was just punching him in self-defense. So here's a lesson that's very important, I think. When he made up that story, the judge, being a wise person, he looked at the peaceful devotee, right? Here's a short man, very peaceful. And the judge looked at him and he said, but how is it possible of this man? So in other words, his devotional qualities were shining out and the judge himself could see his shining devotional qualities. So the judge just threw it out. He said, you're lying. This guy's so peaceful. He wouldn't hurt anybody, right? So that's the way we should present in the world. That's the way we should walk the world. If um, I think that's very important, you know? Yeah. And yeah, I mean, of course, what you're making an important point also, Shastra and Shastra, right? We can use the Shastra, wise words, or we can use a weapon. But I think, you know, there's some verses in Shastra that say, oh, if somebody makes an offense, go kill him or cut out his tongue, right? Do you think that's going to be very effective to, in this day and age? You know, uh, certain things are not meant for our place and time, you know? Are yeah. brahmacharis going out wearing bark? No. Yeah. So certain things do not work in, in this day and age, even if you read them in Shastra. That's why it requires a pure devotee, Messiah, a great personality to interpret Shastra. Not that we can just learn a few things in Sanskrit and think that we know more than our spiritual master. That's what Srila Prabhupada wrote in one letter. He said, people, he said, sometimes, this is what he wrote. This is really heavy. He said, this is in a letter. He said, sometimes my disciples learn a little bit of Sanskrit, and then they think they know more than their guru. And in this way, they are, they are guru killers. Yeah. So there's, there are three things. We can be guru. Uh, there's guru bogey, someone who's trying to enjoy the opulences of the guru. There's a guru tyagi, someone who wants to reject the instructions of the guru. And then there's a guru sevi, someone who just wants to serve the mission of the of the guru and reflect the beautiful qualities of krishna while they do it in all humility so each of us has a choice each every step we take we have a choice every day thank you so much we pray to be guru sevis uh <laughs> krishna prabhu please <laughs> on mute hare krishna modam i have obeisances hare paul my obeisances to you my question is on the papers on the paper, Krishna speak about, I mean, pra Prabhupada commented on the six opulences of Krishna, which, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Very well. Yeah, in the beginning, he mentioned the six opulences, and he said the living entity have 78% of this. Am I right? Right. Yeah. right. So my question is. Up to. We can get up, up to. to. Right. Uh -huh. So if we have 70% of these opulences, for example, beauty, so why do we see a beautiful woman as a maya? Why can't they use this beauty to preach Krishna consciousness and attract people to Krishna consciousness? Instead, yeah. we see them as maya, as temptation. Yeah, why this well, is from God? Yeah, that's a good point. That's, that's a higher consciousness, isn't it? To see some attractive thing, attractive woman, attractive, like you have a beautiful tree behind you, you have a beautiful beach behind you. So to see everything attractive as coming from Krishna, that's a higher consciousness. When someone is in a lower consciousness or just a beginner in spiritual life, they have to protect themselves, like, uh, and they feel like, oh, everything is Maya. Um, you know, the sunset is Maya, the tree is Maya, the ocean is Maya. Anything beautiful, a beautiful woman is Maya. But, you know, when someone comes to a higher level of Krishna consciousness, they can understand that any, what does Krishna say? Any beautiful, opulent thing in this world is just a speck of his splendor. 
So that's a higher consciousness. So we have to try to make progress in our consciousness, not remain on the neophyte platform. You know, Srila Prabhupada expected us to become pure devotees and go back to Godhead at the end of this life, not to remain in such mundane Kanista Adhikari consciousness, which is beginner consciousness, sectarianism, where we're just fighting, criticizing, envious, you know, um, only seeing Krishna in the deity, if at best, and not seeing Krishna in other people. Yeah, that's that's beginner consciousness. We're expected by these great messiahs to go beyond that material consciousness. So yeah, each one of us has, we can gain by becoming Krishna consciousness, by becoming Krishna conscious, we can gain up to 78% of those amazing qualities of Krishna. One of us has That's beautiful, right? Krishna consciousness by becoming Krishna conscious. So when I gain these 78%, like wealth, opulence, strength, well, there's also a, bound to be a kind of distraction you know, in this pure Krishna consciousness. You have to look in the um, in the 21st chapter of Nectar of Devotion and read the different list. It's not Krishna's six opulences. It's 50 qualities that are there in Krishna that ordinary people, ordinary jivas like us can also gain up to a certain point. So read that list of 50. It was too long for me to read it in this class. Uh, you'll find it in the 21st chapter of Nectar of Devotion, which is called the, the qualities of Sri Krishna. So you can find it there. And then, and then then the ones that I read after that, the five and then the five and then the four that are only in Krishna. So yeah, Thank homework, you. a little homework. <laughs> but my enjoyment. <laughs> yeah. when, when you get off your beach, you can do the homework. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, the homework is NOD chapter 21. <laughs> right. <laughs> Anyone know. else with any... Uh, Question, realizations. Bhakta Hassan, please unmute. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Uh, please accept my humble obeisances. Um, <laughs> I have this question I want to ask um, concerning about what um, Sadiq Prabhu just said, like, Punching somebody and the person stays away from him. Um, and this comes to my mind. And for instance, I have some colleagues at work, at work. And these guys, they are Arab people. So sometimes uh, it's more like they are trying to play a joke, you know, and they will hold my beads and they will be holding their fingers like this, like uh, making the sign of, of a pig, you know. Uh, of a, pi a pig? pig? Yeah, like a pig, like they are making a sample of like um, like um, voodoo or something like that, you know? Mm. So, if I get hungry, they stop. You know, if I become very angry, then they stop. Mm -hmm. So, in the Krishna consciousness, anger is not good. So, in this situation, how do I deal with this? Well, there are two answers. For the first thing I would say is keep some you have a desk at work you have a desk yes so keep some prashadam cookies on your desk a big jar of prashadam cookies keep that on your desk and let everyone in the office know that they're free to come and take one of those cookies whenever they like then you'll become the most popular person in the office you'll see it's magic prashadam is magic so that's my first answer do that cookies something people can relate to right and then the other answer i would give is have you ever heard the story of narada muni and the snake narada, no. muni, narada muni had a disciple who was a snake yes okay. came a Vaishnava. and so then what happened was all the boys in the neighborhood boys of the same mentality that you're describing of people in your office the boys in the neighborhood heard that the snake had become a Vaishnava. And so then they started throwing rocks at him and teasing him because they thought, oh, he's not going to bite anymore. He's not going to retaliate because now he's become a devotee. So then the snake was didn't know what to do because he was trying to change and have good behavior now, not act like a snake anymore. So the next time his guru visited, he told the guru, he told Narada Muni his problem. And Narada Muni told him, he said, I told you not to bite, but I didn't say you couldn't show your fangs. 
I told you not to bite, but I didn't say you couldn't show your fangs. So sometimes in a situation like that, we might have to show our fangs, but not bite. But still, even more effective, I would say, is have a jar of prashadam cookies on your desk. And then those people who are mocking you and calling you names, they'll become your best friends by the power of prashadam. You'll see. Next time I see you, I want to know if it worked. That's your homework. Okay, thank you so much. Are you, are, you, are you married? Are you married? No. Okay, well, you, you have a mom? Yes, I have a mom, yes. Okay, get your mom to make some cookies. And if she's a devotee, if she can offer them. If you're, if not, you can offer them. I'm living very far away from my mom. My mom is in Africa. Okay, well, get some devotee. Where, where are you? I'm in Barcelona, Spain. Okay, well, go to the temple. Get some yes, yes. cookies, give a donation. You're probably making a nice paycheck working in Barcelona, Spain. So give a donation <laughs> to the temple and get, <laughs> and get some prashadam cookies from the temple okay. there and put them on your desk in a big glass jar and tell yeah. everyone you're in your office, these are free for everyone. You can come and take 10 every day if you want. As many as you want, you can come and take. And you'll see what okay, the yes. Okay. Okay, I think I think I have a way to do that because uh, most of the time, if somebody has his birthday, they bring some cookies and biscuits and so on. So I think I can do that. Yeah. Yeah, and and even when it's not somebody's birthday, you can have them on your desk. Sheila Prabhupada okay. called Sheila Prabhupada called Gulab Jamans the Iskan bullets, and that's how he captured people's hearts. But bring something that they can relate to, not not gooey Gulab Jamans, because they might think that's a little weird. So that's what I suggest. Let me know next time I see you if it worked. Okay, thank you so much. I'm very thank grateful. you so much, Mother Rukmini. Talking about uh, cookies, that reminded me of Mother Jagannath. Mother Jagannath, Gita Nagri. She used to she used to prepare lots of cookies for me, and I used to distribute it to people. Wow, and wonderful! It's very effective. Yes, wonderful. It melts people's hearts. Prashadam is the secret weapon. Yes, it does. <laughs> Chakra Prabhu, please on mute. Hare Krishna, Mata. Hare Krishna. Yeah, thank you very much for your class. Like, Can you turn always. on your camera, please? It'd be um, nice to see you. No, where well, I am, if even, I, if even I turn it, you might not see me. Okay. okay. You're <laughs> in right. the car. In the car. <laughs> yeah. Is okay. It, is it's it okay. okay now? Yeah. Yes, yes it is. Yeah, so um, my question is, um, uh, when you were describing the qualities of uh, uh, Krishna, and that we, the jivas, the little souls, we can, we can come up to, uh, with about 50 of them. So my question is, does that mean they, they are not there, the qualities are not there, we are yet to develop them? They're there, or... <laughs> they're there, but just undeveloped, right? Just like... Uh... You know, a little child has within himself the ability to walk, right? When he's first born, he's not walking, but um, he has the ability to walk within him. So in the same way, we have that natural ability within ourselves to gain those qualities. And even um, the one Prabhu was asking about the six opulences of Krishna, strength, beauty, knowledge, um, renunciation. What did I leave out? Those six qualities. Even we have those qualities also, but just in a tiny, tiny bit. But in particular, there's a list of 50 qualities that's given in that 21st chapter that, that we can also develop by becoming Krishna conscious. So, um, yeah, the qualities are within us. Otherwise, um, we wouldn't, if we didn't have the, that potential, uh, we wouldn't be able to achieve those qualities. Yeah. Thank All you. Right. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. See, Mother, before you leave, uh, I have a question. I don't think it's particularly uh, related to today's text, mm -hmm. Purge and uh, the uh, Katha you shared. But there have been a few times we had different people speak on this particular platform. And uh, they said that the, the pure devotee, the spiritual master, for example, has no anger, has no pain, does not feel pain. Uh, and I think 
Uh, I would say I am of the opinion that the spiritual master has anger because he he is living in this material world and is living in a human body. So the spiritual master feels pain, but having all these uh, experiences or emotions do not take away his or her love for Krishna and the rendering service to Krishna. Yeah, because you're right. If, if, yeah. One, if one begins to feel that the spiritual master feels no pain, and we understand. I, I was just listening to one a video of Sri Prabhupada and his disciples on a morning walk, and he was talking about initiation, that at the very moment one takes initiation, he bends all his sinful reactions, but he does not have to go back to commit more sinful activities. So if the guru is absolving all our sinful reactions upon himself. And we still think that he does not feel pain. How is that going to make us feel that this person is suffering on my behalf? Therefore, I don't have to continue suffering so that he does not suffer. Please, yes, uh, put some light on it, please. Yes, I agree with you. I think you're absolutely right. The spiritual uh, spiritual personalities have a full range of emotions, but uh, what we have to look at is what, what is their motivation? And Srila Prabhupada gives the examples of Hanuman and Arjuna and how they used anger in Krishna's service, right? Hanuman did, he was asked to go find Sita. He did more than he was asked by burning down the whole city of Lanka. He did that out of anger, but his anger was spiritual. Arjuna Krishna spoke the whole Bhagavad Gita just to get Arjuna to come to the point of spiritual impetus for his, his spiritual anger. So you're right, but we have to look at what is my motivation. If I want to imitate Hanuman or imitate Arjuna, I'm just going to go out in the street with an AK-47 and shoot a bunch of people. No, that's not the proper use of anger. So we have to look at what is the motivation. And certainly the spiritual master would feel very sad when the disciple, he's, to the Prabhupada said he spent hundreds of gallons of blood making these disciples. Once he said to one of his disciples, I am spending hundreds of gallons of blood to make these disciples and you are sending them away. So yes, he feels pain. Yes, he feels pain. So thank you so much. Thank, thank you for you. again inviting me. To Africa, I didn't even have to play, pay the airfare. I'm so grateful to all of you for, for being here and inviting me once again. And may Srila Prabhupada bless you all with a beautiful reflecting heart full of Krishna sun, sunshine. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Thank Hare you. Krishna. So much. Uh, I guess without further questions or realizations, in fact, there was something. Uh, said in the chat room, I have to read it, Mother. Uh, this is from Parmeshwara. Uh, she was saying that I just wanted to express my gratitude to the devotees and Mother Rukmini for a wonderful and enlivening class. Thank so you. So this is from Parmeshwara. Thank Parmeshwara you. is from Gita Nagri. Oh, thank you, Parmeshwara. Thank you all for being here. Thank you for... Mother, I have a question, please. One more question. Wow. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, you no, know, it's just the first one. It's about February. Uh, Saturday was supposed to get get back to you. You know, you always start schedules when you can speak next month, February. Yeah, I think I'm probably not going to be able to do something in the month of February, but you can yeah. ask me. Thank you All so right, much. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Okay. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So, uh, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. So dear devotees, we're going to humbly request you all to kindly unmute and then we chant the loudest Hare Krishna Mahamantra to express appreciation for our big and sweet auntie. <laughs>
हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्णा हरे हरे राम हरे राम हरे राम राम हरे 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 Jai. 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 Jai.